So it looks like about seven people are interested in talking uh, about test-driven infrastructure with Chef. Uh, I don't know whether that's because I have the luck of the draw and I am post-lunch where everybody is either still eating uh, or they're maybe asleep because they've eaten too much. Um, so uh, those of you um, who are standing at the back, stand up for me. People at the back. You guys at the back, stand up. Stand up. Come forward. Come forward. Come and sit closer. Because otherwise, I'll have to shout a really long way. Ah, power is important. Power is important. All righty. OK. So test-driven infrastructure with Chef. Ah, uh, this is the wrong remote. <laughs> Identical. OK. So um, let me start off by asking you a really dumb question. Um, how many of you test your production code? OK, those of you who have not put your hands up, is that because you don't have production code? <laughs> so, so the question is, why do you bother testing your production code? For those of you who couldn't see the people sticking their hands up, most people test their production code, I'm reassured. So well, why do you bother? Why do you do this? Well, most likely it's because you want to catch regressions. Maybe you want to make sure that you meet customer requirements. Maybe you want to build confidence in the code that you're writing. Maybe you want to make sure that the quality you're building is good and is built in and, cap and stays there. Maybe you just want to keep things stable. It seems pretty obvious that you would like to test your infrastructure code as well. Still got the wrong thing. They are absolutely identical. Right. Put that there and I won't pick it up again. So let me ask you a next question. How many of you test your infrastructure code? That's one and a half people. OK, so this is very interesting. And when I ask that question, this is the kind of result I usually get. Yeah. Um, it would have been better if you didn't ask me that question when my boss was sitting right by me. Uh, so, so the question I want to ask is, well, why not? Why don't you test your infrastructure code when you do test your production code? And I'll leave you having a think about that while we go for a little bit of a primer of test-driven development. OK. so. Fundamentally, software engineering is actually a form of learning. The majority of people who are working in a software project have to pick up new tools from time to time. They are working with new organizations. They're solving completely new problems. The customers themselves are sometimes being exposed to problems that they didn't know they had. They're sometimes being forced to put into code or put into some kind of form or something, something which has been on the basis of informal agreement. Or maybe they just didn't even know how that works. So software engineering is fundamentally about learning. How can we make that learning easy? If we can make that learning effective, we'll be effective as software engineers. So it's important to understand that software engineers are not the same as civil engineers. When you build a bridge or even a building, OK, there's some variation about the size and the scale, but pretty much bridges are bridges, right? Buildings are buildings. You're not actually coming across any radical new technology. Sure, there are variations, but you're not often going into completely uncharted territory. Most software developers, when they start out on a project, the chances are they have never done the thing that they're being asked to do before. So you're going into completely unknown territory. So the only thing that you can be absolutely certain of is that you're going to get unexpected changes. Something's going to happen. The one thing you can be certain of is uncertainty. And so we want to encourage effective learning. And the way we get effective learning is by ensuring that we have empirical feedback. So not just feedback, but feedback that we can measure. Feedback which is based on real data. Feedback which is based on something that we can touch, that we can understand, that we can work with. So I'm going to suggest a few things that you could do to ensure that you get empirical feedback. First thing you could do is you could deploy often. Well, that would make sense. If you deploy often, you're going to be able to test your, your assumptions. You're going to verify whether or not the progress you're making is good progress. You're going to be able to understand whether or not there are any problems. All the best code in the world and all the best tests in the world there's no substitute for putting the code out there and getting it in front of real people. So deploy often. And then you want to demonstrate regularly. You want to have a cadence where the stuff that you're working on, you're demonstrating, even if it's just within your team or to stakeholders. But you want to demonstrate frequently. And why? Because every time you demonstrate, you get feedback. And the more feedback you get, the more learning you're doing. The more learning you're doing, the less risk you're carrying. The less risk you're carrying, the better for the project. So you also want to be testing constantly. You always want to be probing at the system making sure that you understand what's happening. If things go wrong, make sure you understand why they went wrong. 
to test constantly, all the time. And you want to make sure that the code you're writing is optimized for reading. So especially for junior developers, the people who first come onto the project, they may well spend the first six months or a year mostly reading code. They may not even get to write the code for really some significant amount of time. And if your code looks like this, then I don't really want to be the person who has to read it. So we need to make sure that what we're working on is readable and understandable. And fundamentally, all of these feedback loops need to be kept short. And the way that we go about this is making sure that we have testing right the way through our systems. Now, the problem with testing is, well, testing is really boring. Testing is that stuff that you do kind of at the end when you've finished the project and somebody says, what about test coverage? And you go, uh, yeah, it's a bit like what about my infrastructure code about that. Uh, so, no, testing is really, really boring, right? You just go, oh, do I have to? And the reason for that is you're doing the testing after you wrote the code. Well, I would argue, and it has been argued very vociferously in the extreme programming community, that you should write your tests first. And the reason for this is because it guarantees you a number of great wins. And so the basic process that we go through when we develop our code in a test-driven way is red, green, refactor. So we start by writing a failing test. We think about the thing that we're going to do. We write the test. The test fails. Then we make the test pass. And now we have the ability to refactor. And we can refactor now because we have confidence that if the test breaks, it means we change something. We can go back and fix it. We have a safety net beneath us. So this cycle is absolutely fundamental to the idea of test-driven development. And here's the golden rule. I'm going to say this a number of times. The golden rule is we never write new functionality without first writing a failing test. So what do we get for this? Well, we get so much when. OK, let me go through that. So firstly, when you write your tests first, you clarify your acceptance criteria. So you know what it is that you're doing. You understand what it is that you're delivering. You've got a handle on the domain. You've got a handle on the stuff that you're trying to do and the problems you're trying to solve. So when you write your tests first, you've got that first and foremost in your mind. And you know when you're done. Because when the tests pass, you're done. So it also encourages loose coupling. Now, there's a really great uh, idea about loose coupling. Because I used to think, well, loose coupling, that sounds kind of sounds important. Maybe I should know about that. Like, what is loose coupling? Well, this is why I've got this uh, rather handsome Mark Levinson separate system here. I don't know if any of you have ever bought uh, when you were a teenager. When I was a teenager, I saved up all my money because there was a stereo in the hi-fi store, uh, and it had 17 different modes of flashy lights and all sorts of displays, and you could tweak everything, and it was in a it was a box, and it had two tapes, and it had a, a, a turntable on the top, and a bunch of other things. But it was, it was a, a thing, like a big thing. Uh, and one day, I kind of thought, you know what? It, it kind of looks cool, and it's got a load of flashy, turny things. But you know what? The sound kind of sucks. So maybe what I could do is I could get a better CD player. So I looked into getting a better CD player, and then I looked at my big, shiny, black box thing, and I realized, well, I can't plug the CD player into the big shiny black box thing, because the big shiny black box thing is just a thing. It's made of various components, but I can't get at them. I can't pull them out and swap them out. I can't alter them or change them or do anything with them. So basically, if I want to do something a little bit better to improve the compact disc player, I just need to throw away the big black box and start buying things again. And that's an example of, of things which are not composable. And the thing is often the case when we do Test writing. I'll come to an example of this shortly. So writing our tests first encourages loose coupling. No big black boxes. So the other thing is it uh, provides executable documentation. So one of the things in, uh, in the Agile Manifesto is the uh, people say, oh, well, Agile people don't like documentation. Bullshit. Who told you that? I mean, seriously. No, we don't like writing vast quantities of manuals that we're going to hand over in a big box and say, there you go, there's the documentation. No, but we do want documentation. But we don't want documentation that ages. We want documentation which is live and grows and changes. So executable documentation. And of course, it grows your regression suite. Because every time you write tests and every time a fault comes, you write a test to catch the fault. Your regression suite goes. And this is very important. If you're writing your tests first, and you run the test, and then something strange happens, or you write your code, and then you run the tests again, and then something breaks, well, rather than 
handing it over to a testing team somewhere else who maybe you haven't been working on the features that you've shipped three months ago. Now you're talking about code that you wrote just now. So the context is right there, fresh in your mind. So you're there, freshly having introduced a problem into the system, the test has caught it, and now you've got fully loaded context and you're gonna be able to fix it more quickly. So, and finally, you avoid gold plating. I'll come to this again shortly, but gold plating is that thing where you think, well, you know, it would be pretty awesome if I did this as well. Uh, hey, well, while we're at it, maybe we could make it do this. Hey, what about a spinny wheel? Everybody needs a spinny wheel, right? I mean, all this extra things that you start ladling on. And the reason you do that is because you didn't write tests. You didn't write tests up front, which defined when you were done. So you just keep on adding functionality in. So avoid gold plating. So fundamentally then, when you're doing test-driven development, you're not just testing the implementation. You're not just testing, does the thing work? You're also testing whether or not the code is well-structured. And so we'll go through this with a, a brief kind of high level. How do we go about writing a unit test? So in order to write a unit test, we need to make sure the thing that we're testing can operate in isolation, like the CD player, okay? Can we get it over here and work on it in isolation? Then we need to instantiate the object. Then we need to work out what the dependencies are and provide them. Then we interact with it. And then we verify that the object behaved as, as it expiated, wow. I actually know what expiation is, given I have a degree in theology, but uh, the object is not uh, dying for our sins. The object uh, <laughs> is behaving as explained. Expiation, wow, never expected to talk about that. <laughs> so um, so the, uh, the object which died for us um, was, uh, was behaving as it was intended. And if this doesn't happen, then it's because there's something wrong with the design, and this is called listening to the tests. So if one of those things is wrong, it's probably because it's badly coupled, or there are unclear dependencies, or the responsibility for the object is unknown. So if the test is hard to write, the design is probably wrong. And this brings on to the whole thing. It's perfectly possible to write really, really great software that is utterly pointless. So this is a superb book, uh, Growing Object-Oriented Software by Steve Freeman and Nat Price. Uh, these guys are part of the London Extreme Programming Community. Uh, and uh, yeah, superb book. Um, there is uh, a gist, which I will publish later, uh, which has a bunch of reading in there that you can look at. I recommend this book. So they say, we've seen projects with high quality, well unit tested code that turned out not to be called from anywhere or that could not be integrated with the system and had to be rewritten. So this brings me to the useless crap diagram. And this is fantastic. So how many of you have ever worked in an environment where you built some software really, really, really well, but you gave it to the customer and the customer said, yeah, that's great, but that's not really what we wanted. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, that's happened to some of you. Okay, what about, have you ever been in a situation where you've been working on some software, or you've built some software, and it's absolutely mission critical and does everything the client wants, but it's horrible! You, you dare not touch it. Anybody ever been in that situation before? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, how many of you have been in a situation where you've got truly terrible code, really badly written, which is also of no use to the client? Yeah, yeah, I've done that too. Okay, that's the useless crap. So what we're actually looking for is the success. So in order to build successful software, we need to be building the right thing and building the thing right. And we do that by writing our tests. And the antidote to this is to actually write the acceptance tests first rather than the unit tests first. And so our circle now looks like this. We start off by writing a failing acceptance test. So the acceptance test is going outside in describing the way we want the system to behave. The test fails, obviously, because we've not written any code. Now we write a unit test, that also fails. Then we make that test pass, we refactor, and then we go back around the circle again. So this is the standard BDD outside in thing. Okay, so there ends my primer on test-driven development. Now, how does this apply to infrastructure code? This is the interesting question. So, at this stage, I'm gonna go for a shameless plug. Um, I wrote that book, um, and uh, if you would like to get that book, you can get 50% off uh, if you use the code AuthD, uh, or 40% off if you buy the ebook. So, there you go. So, in this book, I look at Brian Marek's testing quadrant. Yes? Uh, on the O'Reilly uh, site, yes. 
on the O'Reilly set. So uh, the testing quadrant then. There's various kinds of testing that we could do if we're thinking about systems that we built. So let's just clarify what do I mean by infrastructure code. I'm talking about production code, the code which was responsible for building the infrastructure upon which we deploy our systems. So it's actually pretty damn important, okay? So this code, what kind of tests could we conceivably do? Well, we could do kind of usability tests, and we could do exploratory tests. This is the kind of stuff that QA engineers are great at. The great at kind of how can I do this? Can I, what happens if I fill the entry form with a load of nines? Does it, does it break something? What about if I go backwards and forwards 12 times? That's okay, 13th time it breaks. That kind of exploratory stuff, you can't automate that stuff. That's a special kind of skill. You need a special kind of mind to be good at exploratory and usability testing. So then you've got load tests and penetration tests. Well, those are great. Um, and you probably don't run them all the time, though. And you probably don't automate them. You can automate some of them. You can automate your performance testing and your load testing, but you don't necessarily run them all the time in an automated way. But I guess you could. But then that leads these two over here, your acceptance tests and your unit tests and your integration tests. And so this, this diagram is talking about, well, what is the function of these tests? Are these tests designed for the business? Are they for people who are looking from the outside? Or are they for us, the engineers who are writing the code? And what's the purpose? Does it support the development? Does it support the process of building the software? Or does it help us understand whether or not we're meeting those requirements? And so the ones towards the left are the ones that we as engineers are most frequently engaged in. But we can see we need business-facing acceptance tests and technology-facing unit and integration tests. OK, so how does this work within test-driven infrastructure? Well, it's actually just the same, but just a little bit more complicated. So we start off by writing some acceptance tests. So these acceptance tests are, I'm building some infrastructure. In the case of Chef, you're building some Chef cookbooks. Well, why are you doing that? What problem are you trying to solve? Who's your end customer? Uh, there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. Now, in the Chef community, there's the concept of a wrapper cookbook. So the concept of a wrapper cookbook is something which you would use to deliver a piece of functionality, say a website or uh, an internal application, or it actually solves a specific purpose. And that wrapper cookbook will then pull in library code from elsewhere in order to deliver the functionality you need. So you would write some acceptance tests for your cookbook. And these would be things like, when I go to the website, does the website have a login page? And when I go to the login page, can I log in and use the site? So actually, it looks really quite a lot like the kind of acceptance test that you might have written already as software developers. Or if you're building something a little bit lower down, maybe you're building a continuous integration server, or maybe you're setting up a React cluster or whatever, then you might like to, to make some acceptance tests which basically say, given that this infrastructure has been built, can I use it in the way it's designed? So then we run the acceptance test. So those acceptance tests are going to pass. Well, first time, no, they're not. So then what we do is we write integration tests. So the traditional idea of an integration test is tests working against code that we don't control. Now, it's not quite the same in the world of Chef, but it's kind of similar. Integration tests is what happens when you mix the various bits and pieces that you have, various cookbooks, some of the code that you didn't use, some of the code that you did use, maybe having to talk to external sites. So it's still an integration test. So we're going to write those integration tests, and then we're going to run them. Now, if they pass, well, that's great. Probably a miracle, though, because we haven't written any code yet. If they don't pass, now we write the unit tests. So the unit tests are down at the level we're writing chef cookbooks and recipes. And what we're actually talking about is, well, what resources are we using? So are we looking at files? Are we looking at packages? Are we looking at services? And we're testing down at that level. And when once the unit tests pass, we reel back out to the integration tests. If they pass, we reel back out to the acceptance tests. So it's still the nested loops and feedback thing, but <clears throat> at a slightly more involved level. So if you want to do that, there are a bunch of testing tools that you could use. So ChefSpec is the one which is for unit testing. Uh, ChefSpec is a very powerful and very capable tool. Uh, Test Kitchen is the one which I'm going to talk about most today. This is a framework which allows you to do all manner of integration testing. Server spec is uh, a component which we use with Test Kitchen, which allows us to use Ruby's RSpec syntax to test infrastructure. Uh, Cucumber would be used for your acceptance tests. Uh, and Linux is a piece of software I wrote, 
which uh, is designed to allow you to spin up infrastructure externally so that you can test it. Now, I actually tweeted about this uh, last night because I was having a look at some of the open source projects that I've worked on. Uh, and I am terrible, terrible, terrible. At, well, I, kind of, I guess I write OK software, but I then I kind of forget about it and pull requests appear and I don't look at them. And issues build up and I don't look at them. And so I haven't worked on this tool for really some time. But actually, it still works. And it's really capable and really useful. But there's loads of things that could be added to it could be made even more powerful. So I'm standing here in front of you guys and anybody who sees this on the video and says, today I turn over a new leaf. I'm going to try to be way more responsive on pull requests and way more responsive on issues. And I was thinking about this yesterday I was, as I was in the shower. I was thinking, you know, when you write open source software, you're entering into a contract. It's a funny, it's an unwritten contract. But you're entering into a contract because maybe I wrote something to scratch my own itch. And I stuck it out there because I believe in open source software, great. But as soon as I stick it out there and somebody starts using it, there's an unwritten contract which says, I wrote the software, so I kind of need to maintain it. I kind of need to be responsive when people say it's broken. Now, if you're not prepared to do that, that's fine. Stick something in the readme that says, this is purely for my fun. If you want to use it, go ahead and use it. But I'm an asshole, and I don't respond to pull requests, and I don't respond to issues, so you're on your own, buddy. Um, now, if you haven't written that in your readme, but you don't respond to issues and pull requests, you're an asshole. That means I've been an asshole, so I'm sorry. So focusing in then, we're going to look at Test Kitchen and Service Spec. I'm just going to explain why that is. So uh, we are looking at two different sorts of things. We already saw this on the Brian Marek diagram. We're looking at external quality and internal quality. External quality is pretty easy to judge. So does the thing work? Is it responsive? Is it stable? Is it performance? Internal quality is, can I maintain it? Is it readable? Uh, are, are there a lot of bugs? That's the internal quality. And there's, a, there's an inverse relationship here. So when you start with unit tests, they're really, really useful if what your objective is is to measure and understand internal quality. But they're not that useful if you want to work on external quality. And inversely, your acceptance tests, they're great for verifying the external quality of your systems, but they're not that great for helping you understand the code itself. They help you to understand whether or not you get the domain. But they're not so useful when it comes to actually understanding the quality of the code. And so really, the sweet spot is in the middle here at this intersection, which I'm calling integration. And my actual understanding from my experience in this domain is that we have a curve that looks a bit like this. This is just a sketch. It's not, it's not based on any real data. It's just, it's just a gut feeling. And the gut feeling is that chef spec is super easy to use. And you get you know, a fair amount of value for it. It's super, super easy. A test kitchen gets you way more value, and it's not that much more difficult to use. And then you've got Leibniz up here, which is where you have to start writing acceptance tests in pure Ruby and then orchestrate the spinning up of the machines. Well, that's super, super, super valuable, but it's also super, super, super time consuming and difficult. So for this reason, if we were to integrate this curve and, and measure the value you got from this, it's definitely worth spending our time on test kitchen. So for this reason, we're going to talk about Test Kitchen, also known as Kitchen CI. So what is Kitchen CI? <clears throat> so Kitchen CI is a pluggable framework. It allows you to harness and build your tests in a way which is unique to you. You can choose what it is that you want to write your tests in, and you can use it to test pretty much anything. It gives you an interface to the entire software development lifecycle, from spinning up machines, converging nodes, running tests, verifying that the tests did what they were supposed to do, and destroying them again. And the reason it's called Kitchen CI is because the whole idea is that you'd be able to take this framework and use it as an entry point in your continuous delivery or continuous integration system. So you can write your infrastructure code and then plug it through Kitchen CI, and out will pop, yay, all is good, or boo, not so good. So Kitchen CI is based around a simple life cycle. So we create systems. We're building, we're writing infrastructure code. Those infrastructure codes need to go on a Linux box somewhere. So we need to create those machines. Then we need to converge the node. In chef speak, this means we take our desired state, which we've written in our chef recipes and cookbooks, and we apply them to our machines to make the world the way we want the world to be. And then there's a setup phase. The setup phase is kind of a, a bit of magic in the background, which is responsible for installing whatever you need in order to run the tests. And then there's a verify step where you run some tests 
after the machine is finished converging, and then you destroy the system. And the test step does all of that in one. And the way I like to think about this is, if I were to say to somebody, um, OK, uh, you wanted uh, that um, high availability MySQL setup. Uh, OK, I've done it. Um, it's ready for you to use. Uh, and they might say, OK, um, I'm just going to check it out, see if it's OK. Um, and if it's fine, yeah, we'll go with it. If you were that person, where would you go and what would you do? Well, you'd, you'd log on to the box. You'd do some commands. You'd look to see where the port 3306 was running. You'd, you'd, you'd look to see whether the service was running. You maybe try and make an external connection. You might try and create and drop a database. That's the kind of thing you would do. So what Test Kitchen does is it, it is that person. It does that stuff for you after the machine has been built. And so you can write your tests in whatever you like. Uh, so the common one, the one I use, um, is server spec. Uh, you can write raw R spec. You can use Minitest. You can use some shell-based shell -based programming uh, to run tests. You could use Cucumber. If you're a Python person, you could use those. Hell, you could use BBC Basic for all I care. It doesn't matter. The idea is that Test Kitchen gets out of your way and makes it easy for you to write tests. So in order to get started, you need three things. You need the Chef Development Kit, which is uh, a super easy to install package, which gives you everything that you need in order to start writing Chef cookbooks and testing them. But then because we're going to be building some machines and testing them, you're going to need Vagrant, and you're going to need VirtualBox as well. OK, so how shall we install these tools? Well, we want to write some test-first code. Uh, we're going to do this using uh, a package here, a package there. Well, actually, do we really want to be messing around installing this manually? Well, no. I guess we're going to use Chef to install these tools, right? OK, but we've got ourselves a bit of a problem. We've got a fractal problem here. Because what we want to do is write a cookbook test first that builds a platform so that we can write cookbooks test first, that builds a platform so that we can write. So where do we start? OK. Well, fortunately, I already had one that I made earlier. But what I'm going to show you now is how to write that infrastructure from scratch in a test first way. So I actually did this this morning. Uh, I went through from scratch, uh, and I took screenshots as if I had started from nowhere, and I've made this cookbook available so that should you wish to go ahead and play with Test Kitchen and learn about test-driven infrastructure, you can do so. So you start off by using the Chef CLI. The Chef CLI is what you get from the Chef Development Kit. And what you get in that development kit is a bunch of things. Food Critic, which is a linting tool. Uh, test Kitchen, we're talking about. Chef Spec is the unit testing. The Chef CLI, we've just talked about. Knife is a, is a tool for interacting with the Chef a server in a number of ways. Uh, Chef Client is the thing that you run when you want to actually converge the node. And then there's Berkshelf, which is a dependency solver. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the generate command of the Chef CLI to create a wrapper cookbook. So when you run this generator, all you're doing is you're creating this cookbook. And it creates a bunch of stuff for you. And it drops off all the things that you need in order to get started. So once we've created that, what we end up with is a file that looks like this. So it's in the kitchen directory. It's got a Burks file. It's got an ignore file. It's got the metadata. It's got some documentation and has a default recipe. That is it. It doesn't do very much. So then in order to actually start working with this, <clears throat> Test Kitchen is driven by a file called .kitchen.yaml. And it has a few basic ideas. So the first thing it has is the idea of a driver. So a driver is basically, how are you going to provision the machines that you're going to use for your testing? So in this case, we're going to use Vagrant. But you could use whatever you like. You could use uh, EC2. You could use DigitalOcean. You could use VMware. You could use whatever you like. In this case, we're using Vagrant. So then the provisioner is, well, when, when you're going to run Chef, how are you going to do it? Are you going to use the Chef server? Are you going to use Chef solo? Are you going to use, what are you going to do? By default, we're going to use Chef zero. Chef zero is awesome. If any of you guys are using Chef solo, stop. Just use Chef zero. It's better. It's, it's like an in-memory Chef server that just runs in real time. Super fast, super easy. So use Chef Zero. So then we're talking about the platforms. Well, what kind of systems are we interested in working on? And this is where it becomes really valuable for infrastructure developers. As infrastructure developers, if we're writing a cookbook that is a library code, which is going to be shared by other people, like an Apache cookbook or an Nginx cookbook, you want to be sure that it will work on every flavor of Ubuntu, every flavor of CentOS, every flavor of SUSE, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Windows, whatever you like. AIX, Solaris, HPUX, all the things that Chef supports, 
You want to make sure that it's tested. Now, you try doing that manually, it's going to take a really long time. And when you start building up the matrix, you're talking about hours and hours and hours and hours of manual testing. So the idea behind this file is that you can, you can specify the platforms that you want to test on. In this case, I'm picking Ubuntu 14.04 and CentOS 6.5. And then these are the test suites. So it's called a default test suite. And what it's going to test is the results of applying the default recipe from the kitchen run list. Okay? And there are no attributes. All right. So when we run the kitchen test, what it does is it goes and gets some vagrant boxes. <clears throat> it creates some instances, uh, Ubuntu and CentOS ones. It converges the node without a run list. It'll skip the setup because there are no tests yet. It'll skip the verify status. <clears throat> then it will destroy the instances, and it legs it with zero. So let's run that test. OK, what happens? Well, it goes through, takes a little while. In this case, it takes 3 minutes, 54 seconds. That's because it has to go and get all those files, download them, et cetera. Be quicker the next time around. <clears throat> and we can see it exited zero. OK, so now what we need to do is we need to write a test. Well, this is the default. In fact, this is a conventional test layout. You must follow this layout. So the conventional uh, test kitchen is this. You need a directory called test integration. Those must be there. This corresponds to the name of your suite. So our suite is called default. So we have a directory called default. This level corresponds to the tool that you're using for the testing. <clears throat> We're using server spec, so we'll stick it there. And then this is pertinent to server spec, because service spec is host-oriented. We're just going to run on local host. Uh, and then with, this is the test we're going to run. And this is a spec helper, which just makes everything possible. So let's create that spec helper. This is just boilerplate that you need to have. So we're going to ensure that we've got service spec and path name. We're going to include the stuff we've got. And then we're just going to set up and make sure that we're using the right operating system and commands from service spec code. Literally, you just boilerplate that in. So then we're going to write a test. So this is just our spec. It's just our spec. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, describe the kitchen cookbook default recipe. All right, I will. When I describe the default kitchen cookbook recipe, I'm going to say that it should create a kitchen user. And then we're going to use the standard expect syntax. So we're going to expect, whoops, we're going to expect user kitchen to exist. We're going to expect it to have the home directory of home kitchen and to have a login shell of bin bash. OK, great. So then we're going to go and create our test instances by running kitchen create. That'll create those instances. Now, we can keep them around for a while so that we don't have to keep firing them up again and again and again. But you need to get into the habit of destroying them and starting them again just to make sure that you're not accidentally getting any side effects. So once we've done that, we can run kitchen list. And we'll see that we now have a machine. This is called an instance. So it's made up of the suite that you want and then the platform that you want. You can have multiple suites and multiple platforms. So you can have as many as you like. In this case, we have two. OK, now we're going to run our test. So when we run the test, it's going to run Kitchen Verify. That's going to install Chef. It's going to run Kitchen Setup, which installs the server spec testing tools and anything else necessary to make it work. It will copy our tests up to the instance. It will run those tests. And then it will report back. So what we're going to do then is we're going to run the tests and watch the test fail. Well, obviously. It should create a kitchen user, but it didn't. That's because we haven't written any code yet. OK, so let's write the test to make it pass. So this is an example of a simple chef resource. We're specifying that it's a user resource. It has the name kitchen. We're going to specify that it supports managed home. That basically means we would like it to create the home user when we build it. And we'd like it to have the shell of bin bash. Fine. So now we're going to reconverge the Ubuntu node we'll do it by running kitchen converge Ubuntu. This will run Chef. It will apply the recipe that we just wrote. And when we do so, we see that it created the user kitchen. So now we can run the test again. And this time, the test passes. The kitchen cookbook default recipe should create a default user, a kitchen user, and it did. So now let's run the test on the, kitchen, on the CentOS node. That also passes. Cool. OK, so um, now what we're going to do is we're going to ensure that you have Ruby in your path. The reason I had to do this is because on this box, I had not installed Ruby. Now, one of the things that you get with the Chef development kit is this command called Chef Shell Init. What it basically does, if you type Chef Shell Init and then the type of shell that you have, it says, well, if you just copy and paste this, then you can get the Ruby and the gems, which are part of the Chef development kit available to you in your shell right now. So that's what I did. I run Chef Shell Init bash. I copied and pasted it, and now I've got Ruby. Ruby is available, my thing. And the reason we do that is because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy. So we've got a passing test. We've got some functionality. Yay, let's deploy. 
So I'm using a chef server in this instance, uh, but you could use chef zero. Um, so what you do then is you run Burks install. So Burks shelf is the dependency solver. So in this case, we have no dependencies because we've just written one recipe. But later on, we'll have more dependencies because we'll be depending on upstream cookbooks, which in turn depend on other cookbooks. And we need to solve those dependencies. So we've resolved the dependencies. And then we've put them all available just in the same way that Bundler does, puts them all in one place so that we can use them. And then we're going to upload them to our chef server. So they've gone up to my chef server, and now we can use them. So now I'm going to bootstrap a machine. So in this case, I ran uh, the DigitalOcean uh, knife plugin, and I launched the machine. Uh, and it installed Chef, and it ran Chef on my machine. And I logged onto the machine, and I logged in, and I tried to connect to the kitchen user. And it said, no directory. Logging in with home equals root. Well, that's a bit odd. So what's going on here? Well, OK, remember the golden rule. <clears throat> we never write new functionality without writing a failing test. So clearly, we have missing functionality. We did something wrong. You could call it a bug, or you could call it missing functionality. But on an Ubuntu machine, we don't have a directory, despite the fact that we asked Chef to do so. What is going on here? Well, so what we need to do, then, is we need to write a failing test. So this test says that it should have a home directory of home kitchen, and it should be owned by kitchen. So let's run this against CentOS. Test passes. Cool. So on the CentOS machine, we do have a home directory. No problem. What about on Ubuntu? Ha. Huh. OK. We don't have a home directory. Well, all right. Well, how are we going to fix that, then? Well, turns out that we just need to do directory home kitchen, owner kitchen, and that's done. Now, I think this might actually be a bug, um, but it's always been known that Red Hat is opinionated about the way that it creates users. So when you create a user with Red Hat, you will get a default shell, and it will create your user directory for you. That is non-standard from a Unix perspective, but Red Hat standard, so that's why CentOS does it. Uh, Ubuntu does not do that. It just creates the user. It doesn't give you a shell. It will just give you bin sh, and it doesn't give you a home directory. So now we've created it, and now we converge the node, and it creates our directory, and we run the test. Uh, oh, 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 interesting, run it on CentOS. Idempotence happens, so nothing happens. Didn't need to do anything. The directory was already there. Now the tests pass. Great. So what do we do? We bump the version, we release, and we deploy. So the version is controlled in a file called metadata.rb. So the metadata says what version it is, and we're going to bump it by a patch version. We're going to observe semver, semantic versioning. So we're going to bump it by a patch version because we fixed a bug, basically. And now we're going to do Burks install and Burks upload. Now we've uploaded it to our Chef server, and we could carry on and we could deploy our system again. Now remember, we never write new functionality without writing a failing test. So let's add another test and watch it fail. This time we think, well, we really need VirtualBox and Vagrant, don't we? So we could do a bunch of more complicated tests. But in this case, all we're going to do is we're going to say, well, when we run VBox managed version, it should match this regular expression, which basically says the way VirtualBox prints it out, it just tells you what version it is, version.version.version r version. Likewise, when we do Vagrant, same thing. So now we write the code to make it pass. In this case, all we need to do is include library code from upstream. So we're going to include VirtualBox and Vagrant. And then <clears throat> because the Vagrant upstream cookbook is a bit poor, or rather a bit old. Um, I forked it, and I improved it. Uh, and my pull request has not uh, gone in yet. Um, so uh, we're using, just in the same way you would with a gem file, we're using a Vagrant cookbook and saying, get it from there. So then we converge the node, book shelf solve the dependencies, and now the tests pass. Great. OK. So we bump the release. This time it's 0.2.0 because we added a feature. OK. And we add the dependencies in the metadata. That's important, because that's how Burke Shelf works. It looks in the metadata and says, what dependencies do I need, and then goes through and does that recursively. If you're interested in how semantic versioning works for Chef, have a look at this uh, URL there. So finally, then, we need the Chef development kit, and we need Git. Well, that's straightforward. We're just going to do the same kind of test. We're going to write the test. This time, we run it. The test will fail. Well, adding Git is super simple. We just do package Git. Adding the Chef development kit is a little bit less straightforward because we need to work out what are we going to call the file, where do we get it from. Uh, I'll run through it very quickly. So what we're doing is we're talking about the platform family. 
So whenever Chef runs, something in the background called OHI runs. This profiles your system, and it tells you what kind of a system it is, and makes that data available to you at runtime. So we're then saying, well, when it's a Debian-type machine, so an Ubuntu machine or a Mint machine or whatever, then the package name is going to be, and we're going to calculate it, and then we're going to get it using the remote file resource, and then we're going to send a message to the dpackage resource and install it. And we're going to do the same with Red Hat, only the name is slightly different. And that's all we need to do. Now, this relies on the idea of a cookbook attribute, which is some default settings that we would use. So in this case, we're saying that the base URL is opscode omnibus packages in S3, and the version we want to install is 0211. You can always override these at any stage in your system. So then we go ahead and we converge the node, and the tests pass. Yay. Now we have a kitchen user, a home directory, VirtualBox, Vagrant, the Chef Development Kit, and Git. I call that success. Pretty awesome. So my conclusion comes from Michael Feather's fantastic book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. So straightforwardly, to be blunt, code without tests is just bad code. Okay? It doesn't matter how well written it is. It doesn't matter how pretty or object-oriented or well encapsulated it is. With tests, we can change the behavior of our code quickly and verifiably. Without them, we really don't know if our code is getting better or getting worse. And that applies to infrastructure code as much as it applies to production software. So, what next? Well, one of the things that you probably need to do is speed up the tests. Because tests that take too long to run end up not being run. Now, there's ways you can do that. There's a Docker driver and there's an LXC driver to Test Kitchen, which makes things way, way, way quicker. So uh, if I'd had time, I would have demonstrated that to you, because it's really awesome. Next thing, of course, you want to do is you want to automate all the things. So you want to get this running. You want your cookbooks to be running, maybe plugged into Travis, so that all your tests run, and you can always see. If somebody submits a PR, or somebody submits some change which fails linting, you want to know about it right away. If you're a Ruby developer, you might be familiar with the idea of guard. So you can have something running which spots whenever you've made a change. And then it will run the tests for you right away so you get feedback faster and faster and faster. And then, of course, you want to plug it directly into Jenkins. And that way you have an end-to-end -end tested system built on the foundations of test-driven development, which have been proven to be effective throughout the agile and extreme programming movement in the last 15 years, applied directly to Chef Code. So thank you very much.